So welcome to Fridays at One, sponsored by the Lifelong Peer Learning Program, LP Squared, at the Graduate Center of CUNY. LP Squared is a vibrant organization of adult learners. We offer Fridays at One events three times a semester, which are public programs, open to the CUNY community and to the general public. LP Squared joined the Graduate Center in 2020, and this is one way we give back to our community. We invite well-known figures in the arts and sciences to give informal talks or conversations, followed by a question and answer period. So everyone, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So today, it's my pleasure to introduce Hal Brands and Michael Beckley, authors of a provocative book, Danger Zone, A Coming Conflict with China, published last year. Hal Brands is a scholar of American foreign policy. He's Henry Kissinger, distinguished professor of global affairs at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, DC. He's a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and he's the author of many previous books about U.S. foreign policy. Michael Beckley is Associate Professor of Political Science at Tufts University and a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. His research is focused on great power competition. So welcome, Hal and Michael. Uh, now, the title of your book is Danger Zone. So what exactly do you mean by Danger Zone? Al, you want to start off? Sure, i would be happy to start. Thank, thank you for having us, Ken. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, and to have a chance to, to speak with your community. Um, so on the question you asked, uh, the danger zone really refers to the period between about 2025 and the end of this decade, because the argument we make is that that half decade, you know, plus or minus, is really going to represent the most perilous period in the competition between the United States and China that's now underway. And so it's become common to think of the U.S.-China relationship as a superpower marathon, a 100-year struggle, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use for a long, protracted competition. And it may very well be that, but, but long, protracted competitions can have periods of greater and lesser danger. That was certainly the case during the Cold War, for instance. And so when you think about the period of the U.S.-China relationship where not just competition, but sort of no, no kidding, great power war is possible, the period that we worry most about is the latter half of this decade. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get into the why of that, but sort of just the, the quick answer is that um, during that period, China is going to have a very attractive window of opportunity to reshape the international system. It will increasingly have the capabilities it needs to, say, uh, uh, try to forcibly annex Taiwan and bring it under the mainland's control. And it will be tempted to use those capabilities rather than waiting for things to get better and better because things won't get better, because China is, is looking at a deteriorating strategic position over time, particularly when it comes to its economy and when it comes to its relationship with the outside world. And so when this has happened in the past, countries often develop a sort of use it or lose it mentality, a now or never mindset that makes them more prone to running risks, even catastrophic risks, to get what they want while they think they can get it. And Michael, uh, I should ask, when you say the coming conflict with China, what do you mean by that, by conflict? Well, it could mean um, a straight up hot war, as Hal alluded to. Uh, we we worry that um, China is preparing for a potential assault on Taiwan, and President Biden has made clear that the United States would respond militarily. But even if you don't have an open clash over Taiwan, we worry about essentially a Cold War situation where China is also going to be advancing, trying to carve out an exclusive economic zone largely across the global south, and there will also be political ramifications of that as China exports aspects of its authoritarian political model and tries to bend international organizations in ways that are just more favorable to helping the Chinese Communist Party remain in power domestically. So, you know, in economics, diplomacy, and then obviously in the military sphere, you could have a series of showdowns with 
the United States. And this is just what history suggests that when you have a power that's peaking, they tend to become much more prickly and aggressive and to identify the main uh, upholder of the existing order as their primary enemy. And if you've been listening to what Xi Jinping has been saying in his recent speeches and statements, he has explicitly identified the United States as the source of a lot of China's troubles of creating encirclement around China, trying to drag down China's economy. And he is he is calling on the Chinese people to gear up for what he calls um, to dare to fight and to prepare for stormy seas ahead. So this is all just very ominous. So in this common conflict, which could be violent, what, you know, what would um, uh, compel China to risk war in the near future? Well, I think it's a, it's a combination of ambition and loss aversion. And, and so you know, China has made no secret of the fact that uh, it wants to bring Taiwan under the control of the mainland. I mean, that that's been a, sort of you know written into the the constitution of the CCP of the the PRC, I should say, uh, for decades. Xi Jinping has added a little bit of urgency to it by saying that this is something, the Taiwan problem is something that cannot be handed down from generation to generation. Uh, by which many people think he means it should not be handed down to the next generation of Chinese leaders. In other words, it should happen on Xi Jinping's watch because he views it as a very important part of his legacy and a critical contribution to you know, sort of the portfolio of achievements he hopes to leave behind when he eventually departs the scene, which he doesn't seem to think will be you know, within the next few years, certainly. And so there, there's simply kind of the ambitions that often come with uh, growing power, and China's power has certainly grown over the past 45 years in particular, there is a growing ability to achieve some of the goals that China has articulated militarily. And so if you look at close studies of the balance of military power in the Western Pacific, it indicates, in my view, that you know if a war were to start over Taiwan in the next few years, it would kind of be a coin flip regarding whether the United States was able to beat back a Chinese assault in in, um, in concert with Taiwan and potentially other, other countries. And the balance is going to get more favorable from China's perspective through the end of this decade as the People's Liberation Army completes its current round of reforms, many of which are focused on developing the sorts of capabilities that would be necessary to either conduct a blockade or an all-out assault on Taiwan, and some of which capabilities the PLA has been demonstrating uh, in its exercises around Taiwan, particularly over the past year. But, you know, typically uh, countries don't take huge risks, and invading Taiwan will be a huge risk from Xi Jinping's perspective unless they also worry that not taking the risk will lead to something really bad happening, right? And so we, we see this historically as well. And the really bad thing that Xi Jinping has to worry about, you know, there's sort of the specific and the broad thing. The specific thing is that Taiwan is slipping away from the mainland politically and to some degree diplomatically. And so with every year that passes, the Taiwanese population becomes more and more averse to unification with China because they've seen what has happened to Hong Kong, which accepted, didn't really have a choice, but accepted a, a one country, two systems arrangement and then found out that that was actually a one country, one system uh, arrangement. Um, and they're, they're also losing Taiwan diplomatically in the sense that the United States, Japan, other countries are expanding their military dealings with Taiwan, they're expanding their diplomatic dealings with Taiwan, the United States uh, is really treating Taiwan as an independent state in all but name. And so the Chinese have made clear that they worry that the status quo in the Taiwan Strait is eroding. What they don't see or what they choose not to acknowledge, of course, is that in many ways it's their own aggressive behavior that is eroding the status quo by making the United States think that it has a little choice but to try to strengthen Taiwan's position. But when you put all of this together, the fear of losing something that the CCP and Xi Jinping in particular wants very badly with the ability to do something about it, that's where you start to get the mix of calculations that can lead countries uh, 
to make really rash and sometimes catastrophic decisions to go to war. But are the, are the Chinese ready now to do this? Or do you think they need to wait a number of years to be readier or? Well, uh, Xi Jinping has called on the Chinese military to be ready by 2027 to carry out an assault on Taiwan. That doesn't mean he'll order it in 2027, but that's kind of like the basic guidelines. But I think it's it's a combination of the fact that China is coming off an epic period of military modernization. Over the last decade, it's been building warships at a rate that I don't think any country has matched since World War II. And I think almost more importantly is the ammunition that China has amassed. China has the most diversified and robust conventional missile force in the world. And there's obviously more than a thousand of these advanced missiles trained on Taiwan. And you've also had a huge expansion of China's amphibious capabilities. So it's all um, very ominous. And the, the flip side of it is that the United States and Taiwan have been slow to react to China's military modernization. So they still rely on advanced forces that but that are relatively small. So like Taiwan relies on things like F-16s and Abrams tanks um, and, and traditional warships. And the problem, these are all very advanced platforms, but they're parked in the open at exposed bases. And so China's war plan potentially calls for trying to wipe out a lot of those in a sort of Pearl Harbor style strike at the outset of a war. And so they may not end up doing that much good. And the United States is in the same boat. So the only military bases the United States has within 500 miles of Taiwan are on Okinawa, Japan. Um, and China of, has developed missiles that are, are targeting those bases, um, as well as bombers that can reach them quite easily. And then if those bases are wiped out, the United States has to fight from Guam, assuming China doesn't use its so-called Guam killer missiles to disable that base. So it's just it's a fundamental problem of China having figured out this sort of asymmetric strategy to kneecap its main opponents at the outset of a war and the slow pace with which the United States and Taiwan have moved to you know spread out their forces, to harden their bases, and to try to get away from these large, powerful but exposed platforms, like in the case of the United States, obviously aircraft carriers that are now quite vulnerable to China's array of munitions and, and new platforms. So it's it's really that combination of those two things. So we're neither the Taiwanese nor Americans are really prepared to contain China, right? Now? Mil militarily, no. I mean, they're certainly not where they would want to be. Now, I mean, I, I think it, it's important to be clear about the difficulty of what China would be attempting. And, and so Mike has laid out, and we, we talk about this in some detail, all the difficulties that the United States and its allies uh, would potentially face. The tyranny of geography is real in the Western Pacific. But if China were to try to um, either institute kind of a crushing blockade of Taiwan, or more seriously still, conduct some sort of airborne and amphibious assault to forcibly conquer Taiwan, that would be an incredibly challenging military operation. You know, depending on who you ask, it might be the biggest amphibious assault in history, outstripping even the Normandy landings in, in 1944. It would require moving, you know, large quantities of uh, personnel and equipment over a body of water that can be pretty rough most months of the year, trying to land on you know, one of a handful of beaches that are suitable for an amphibious landing and then advancing across an island that has terrain and geography that's very suitable for defense. Taiwan has jungles, it has mountains, it has uh, big, dense urban environments. And so, you know, we, we certainly don't want to make it sound like this would be a cakewalk from Beijing's perspective, because it most certainly wouldn't. The The challenge, and, and so what this, this conclusion this leads you to is that if Taiwan, if the United States, um, if some allies in the region, chiefly Japan, frankly, that's the only one that really brings much capability to bear, were to do the right things and make the right preparations, it would be really, really difficult for China to conquer Taiwan. Or at the very least, the risk of failure would be sufficiently high that even a risk acceptant Xi Jinping might hesitate to undertake something of this nature. The problem is that while all of these countries are in some ways doing the right things, they're doing them at a fairly 
I'm sorry, here we seem to have lost uh, Hal. Michael can. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to just pick but up. But a lot of the preparations that are being, yeah. oh, did I try? Yeah, oh, it's all right, I didn't say anything important. Yeah, uh, we lost you. I was about to complete your sentences. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, the, the point I was making is that it's not that hard if the US, Tokyo, Taiwan, right, make, make the right preparations. The problem is they're making them at too leisurely a pace. And so the military modernization programs, the defense concepts that all these countries are implementing, really aren't going to mature until the early 2030s, although Japan, Japan is maybe a partial exception to that with some of the reforms they've made in the past year, which will come after the period of maximum danger. And so it's it's not that we don't have a clue how to do this. We, we do. We're just not moving fast enough. Yeah. So that's more reason for the Chinese to act sooner than later, right? Yeah, I think that's the 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 scary aspect of this because you know the United States, um, you know, if you look at the U.S. Navy and the Air Force, it's still in to a significant degree the force that Ronald Reagan built. So a lot of these platforms were built in you know in the peak of the Cold War in the 1980s, and the U.S. has been delaying air and naval force modernization for decades because you had the end of the Cold War and the peace dividend. Um, and then you had uh, 9-11 and the shift to the war on, on terror. And then you had the 2008 financial crisis and a period of austerity. And so you, we, the United States has just been kind of kicking this can down the road. And at this point, you know, there's been high profile incidents of American ships just bursting into flames or cracks in the hulls of, uh, you know, old uh, sort of workhorse bombers um, and fighters. And so a lot of these forces are going to have to be retired. So there's going to be a sort of a mass retirement of major legacy platforms in the mid to late 2020s. So U.S. striking power is actually going to dip temporarily during this dangerous period at the same time that China is its military modernization is cresting. And so, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of factors that would go into a Chinese decision to assault Taiwan. But just this window of military opportunity um, is sort of a gaping hole and huge vulnerability for the United States and Taiwan that obviously would make the decision a lot easier for Xi Jinping if he decides to um, use military force. Now, what about the Taiwanese themselves, um, their views, their preparations? Um, I saw some poll recently saying that the, the, the current party in power, which is pro-independence, is, is falling in polls. Um, what what's your views on, on what's happening in, in Taiwan right now? It, it's really kind of a similar story to what's happening in the United States, particularly in kind of the defense realm, where Taiwan has adopted in principle something that looks kind of like what defense strategists would call a porcupine approach, where you buy lots, you know, lots of relatively small, cheap capabilities that can just inflict sky high costs on somebody who tries to fight their way across the Taiwan Strait and subdue the island. So mobile air defenses, sea mines, anti-ship missiles, drones, so on and so forth. And, and that's the right strategy for Taiwan to pursue. There's talk about creating an expanded reserve force because the Taiwanese have observed correctly that Ukrainian reserve forces, the territorial defense force, was vital in holding back the Russian assault early on in the conflict and kind of plugging gaps in the Ukrainian military's uh, lines and forces since then. And, and so if you if you look at kind of like what's happening on paper, it's most, if not all, of the right stuff, the stuff that you would want to see happen. The problem is that the implementation of this is very slow. It remains politically contested. And so it was a decent political fight for the current government to uh, sort of expand uh, training of reservists, essentially sort of, you know, mandatory service for military age personnel in Taiwan. And even now, it's not anywhere near what it ought to be if you really think that your country's survival is in doubt. Um, there is even more prosaic issues like, you know, in Ukraine, my guess is that, um, you know, many, if not the majority of military age males had fired an AK-47 or, some, you know, some, some sort, they had some sort of experience with firearms prior to the Russian invasion, which is something that comes in, you know, kind of handy when your country gets 
uh, attack. That's certainly not the case in, in Taiwan. So the, the preparations are happening, but they're happening too slow. And uh, the harsh reality is that Taiwan is talking, but not acting like a country who's independent, quasi-independent, I guess, quasi-sovereign existence could be ended within the next few years. With respect to the politics of it, the trend in Taiwanese politics over the past decade really has been one in which the KMT, which is basically the, the party that favors closer relations with China, perhaps with an eye to eventual unification, has gotten waxed repeatedly in national elections by the DPP, which is the party that, as you pointed out, is more independence leaning, although what that actually means in practice has evolved over time and Tsai Ing-wen uh, has, has not been particularly forward leaning on independence issues because she's pretty prudent and understands that the one thing that could really get Taiwan attacked tomorrow would be a declaration of independence. There is some indication that the DPP is slipping in the polls. They didn't do well in local elections the last time around, although local elections are not necessarily predictive of the larger national scene. The KMT thinks that it has identified a wedge issue in cross-strait relations. And so uh, the exercises that uh, the Chinese carried out last August certainly got Taiwan's attention, particularly because there was a little bit of a sense that this was a crisis that the U.S. and Taiwan kind of blundered into with a visit by Nancy Pelosi that, that may or may not have been ill-advised. And so when Tsai Ing-wen was in the United States recently on a transit uh, en route to Central America, uh, her predecessor was actually on the mainland talking about Taiwan and China as representing one people and arguing that Taiwan needs a new approach, presumably a more conciliatory approach, to handling its relations with Beijing. It, it has yet to be established, certainly it has yet to be proven, whether that represents a winning electoral approach or not. I, I have my doubts simply because Again, the polling indicates that Taiwanese national identity grows stronger every year, and fewer and fewer Taiwanese voters have much interest in moving toward unification with China. What most of them want is simply a perpetuation of the status quo. So I, I don't know that the balance of political forces is changing dramatically, but the KMT is at least testing that thesis. Michael, hypothetically, say if China captures Taiwan, or, or succeeds in in in, in um, bringing Taiwan into into the Chinese sovereignty. Um, what would the next strategic goal be? How how would the Chinese use Taiwan in terms of uh, the rest of the Pacific and Asia? Well, China has been very clear that its territorial claims don't. Uh, stop with Taiwan. In some ways, they sort of begin with Taiwan. Ta China has claims on roughly 80% of the East and South China Seas, including disputed features um, between itself and the hated historical enemy Japan. Um, and so that's why the Japanese are, are so freaked out about a Chinese assault on Taiwan, because they worry that their, uh, you know, their islands, that they're a part of this Ryukyu island chain that stretches from the Japanese main islands down um, to within about 90 miles of Taiwan would be sort of the next logical point of attack. You could also see a situation where China decides to teach the Philippines um, a lesson for the fact that it brought a case against China in uh, the world court um, at The Hague, where the world court ruled that uh, China's territorial claims in the South China Sea were null and void, and you've had a series of uh, major disputes and, and fishing disputes between those two countries. And now that the Philippines is opening up new bases for the United States, uh, China could use Taiwan as a natural launching pad to bludgeon the Philippines and really just to project more military power down through the South China Sea, which the CCP is not only views as sort of critical to its, its territory making China whole again, but you know, roughly you know, the vast majority of China's trade, which makes up about 40% of China's economy, passes through that South China Sea. And so it's a critical 
sea lane, a potential pulse point that the United States or other countries could squeeze in a time of conflict. So you'd expect China to try to do really what it's doing right now uh, in, in the sort of gray zone, you know, using its maritime militia, fishing fleets, Coast Guard vessels to, to slowly take over the South China Sea. You would just see that accelerated to a great degree. I think more important than just the territorial expansion, though, is the shattering of U.S. credibility as a security guarantor that would take place if China were somehow to successfully conquer Taiwan, or frankly, even to just uh, attack Taiwan in the first place, regardless of how the conflict uh, plays out. Um, you would have lots of allies around the world questioning, well, is the United States going to lift a finger for us if they didn't do so in the case of the Taiwanese, despite the fact that it's American law to maintain the U.S. capability to be able to potentially intervene in Taiwan and to uh, sell Taiwan arms such that it can defend itself. Um, that's not a great look for the United States. And I would also worry just about the long-term effects on um, the sort of balance of ideology internationally. It seems like between Putin invading Ukraine um, and China starting to get much more aggressive in East Asia, these authoritarian regimes have really found their feet in a way that they hadn't uh, in the immediate years after the end of the Cold War and are now espousing this alternative vision of international order where the great civilizations that have thousands of years of history and their telling should be granted their spheres of influence and should have sway and essentially hegemony over their immediate neighborhoods and other countries, in particular the United States, need to back off. I mean, that sort of hierarchical um, vision, um, uh, that revanchist vision of international order, I think would get a huge shot in the arm, obviously, from a Taiwanese conquest or from a Chinese conquest of Taiwan. Well, <clears throat> just recently, Tom Friedman in, in the New York Times, he visited China and Taiwan and he wrote this long article. And I thought it was interesting, it was his title. And he asked, what exactly are America and China fighting about? How? What's your answer to that? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of like where, where to start, right? And so there's ev ev everything, you know, in the narrowest sense, because we've been talking about Taiwan, the U.S. and China are competing over the balance of power in the Western Pacific, and that may that may sound like an abstract uh, stake, I suppose, except that. The Western Pacific and East Asia constitutes, by some measures, the most economically dynamic part of the globe. It's one of uh, three regions around Eurasia, the other two being the Middle East and, and Europe, that the United States has historically felt are so important economically and strategically that it cannot tolerate another power, particularly a hostile power, dominating those regions and using their resources and strategic geography to increase its global reach. That's how the United States ended up fighting World War II against Japan, uh, for instance. And if you had a China that was preeminent in East Asia and the Western Pacific, which again, the, the Chinese make you know no um, pretense of wanting anything other than that. They're very clear that this is their goal you would have a United States that was essentially locked out of one of the most important regions in the world and had lost the ability to influence events there, you know, presumably would face economic discrimination in the countries of the region, and, and it would generally just find itself uh, more liable to coercion and being overtaken on the international stage. So that, that might be thing one. Uh, if that's not enough for you, there's kind of the ideological uh, clash here as well. And so great power rivalries tend to be clashes about ideas as much as they are clashes about power. Um, you know, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, the Napoleonic Wars, the Peloponnesian War, you, you name it. All of these conflicts have had strong ideological components, and there is a very strong ideological component to the U.S.-China rivalry today. China has made very clear that it believes that it is offering a system of government and a model of how government relates to society that is superior to the one that the United States and other advanced democracies offer. Um, and it's also made clear that as it pursues influence around the world, it's going to do so uh, 
with the goal of making the world safe for the continued rule of the Chinese Communist Party, which will have the effect of making the world increasingly unsafe for democracy elsewhere. And so just to give you one example of this, back at the end of 2020, the Australian government said, we think it would be a good idea to have an international inquiry into how COVID got started and how it escaped China and how we got to this point where tens of millions of people around the globe have lost their lives. Seemingly an innocuous request, but of, of course, from a Chinese perspective, this is very dangerous because it threatens to cast an unfavorable light on the policies that the CCP pursued during the early days of the pandemic and presumably a lot of the things they did after that as well. And so the Chinese response was to hit Australia with some pretty harsh economic sanctions and to argue, at least initially, they've walked back on this a little bit now, that the sanctions would not be lifted until Australia fundamentally changed its civil society. Because what they demanded was essentially the censorship of think tanks and newspapers that were deemed to be anti-Chinese. And you read these demands, you think, well, that's a weird thing to ask for. But of course, it makes sense from a Chinese perspective. And it would have had pretty dramatic implications for freedom of speech and the rule of law within Australia. And so this, this competition of ideas would be a second thing. But then there, there's even a third thing beyond that. And, and this is the ability to, let's say, kind of um, dominate the frontiers of innovation uh, in the coming century. And so part of the thing we do in the book is to look in a fair amount of detail at some of the technological issues between the United States and China. And it's fairly clear that China believes that whoever dominates the critical technologies of the coming age will dominate the coming age. Uh, and so through a variety of programs, Beijing has been investing massively in what it believes will be game-changing technologies like uh, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, uh, so on and so forth. And so this is a battle for economic leadership as well. And you can go on and on and on, but um, th there are you know quite a number of actually very significant issues dividing the United States from China. And so it's not as though it's simply a matter of misunderstanding. I think the reality is that the two sides understand each other all too well. Now, uh, Michael, on the tech, uh, technology, um, can China surpass us? Um, is is it realistic this, you know, that they, they could fight and, and, and beat us technologically? But yeah, it's I don't I don't think it's so much like let's look at a scoreboard and see who has more technological patents or or market share. I think what China has realized is that um, what's really crucial for long term influence, which is really what they're after. I mean, technology is a means of influence is that you need to control what the Chinese call choke points in the global economy. And so some these are things that other countries can't live without in, in a modern Age. And so these can be high tech things like computer chips. So China obviously is investing billions of dollars in trying to become um, the dominant producer of, of all range of computer chips. But it can also be something relatively low tech like medical supplies or, or rare earth materials. But the idea is that if you can monopolize those critical choke points in the global economy uh, or telecommunications networks, for example, then you can lord that over other countries. You can reduce China's dependence on foreign powers like the United States, while at the same time gaining leverage over lots of other countries because they basically have to come to you for access. And you can use that not just to pressure them into economic concessions, but to get them to tow the CCP line um, on any political issue uh, that you, you wanna name, whether it's Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, anything. So China, China's latest five-year economic plan explicitly calls for achieving primacy in those areas, those choke points in the global economy. And the CCP has done all of us on the outside world a, a solid by literally listing out what those what they believe those choke points to be. And I think that if the United States and its allies just stand idly by, that China could in fact achieve. A monopoly. I mean, in fact, in some ways, they already did. We, we discovered, for example, during COVID that, you know, if we want to get access to PPE, that a lot of that is manufactured in China. We found out during the supply chain crunch that China is the dominant producer of a whole range of, of products. Um, and so it just shows that uh, if you just rely purely on a free market 
system um, and you don't have any kind of government intervention to try to be strategic in terms of what you need to protect to ensure your national security that China has already is already moving full steam ahead and I you know I I have my skepticism about their ability to really dominate key high-tech industries I think the semiconductor industry is a key example of that so over the last decade China has spent billions of dollars in that area and at this point, their most advanced computer chips are about as advanced as a flip phone. And Xi Jinping recently launched a, a corruption campaign, an anti-corruption campaign into that industry because there was so much fraud that had been uh, created by all the money they were throwing at the industry. But, you know, uh, in, in other areas, um, you know, China has already established itself as the major producer around the world. So it's clearly something that uh, the United States has to take seriously. I think the Biden administration is is well on top of this, and that's why you're probably likely to see a whole series of um, investments on the U.S. side and investment restrictions going out onto the Chinese side. Um, you know, <clears throat> one of the things you say in your book, right, is that China is more dangerous now because it, it, it is peaking out. Um, and that uh, I think you write how Xi Jinping has been tormented by the nightmare of Chinese decline. <laughs> um, are they really in decline? Could you explain to us what, what, what you mean? Yeah, so you know, political scientists often talk in terms of rising and falling powers. And the idea is that you know, rising powers expand, falling powers retrench, and it's a pretty neat dichotomy or binary uh, between the two. But uh, historically, there's, there's not actually a lot of congruence between how states behave and that binary. And, and so what Mike and I have tried to do is come up with a better way of thinking about rise, fall, those sorts of dynamics and how they map onto behavior. And I think the best way of framing where China is, is that it's a peaking power, as, as you say, right? And so it's a country that has enjoyed a spectacular rise over a couple of generations at this point, but it is losing steam quickly on two critical areas. And so the future is not going to be one of kind of steady, confident Chinese ascent. It's going to be one of stagnation economically and strategically, which creates some pretty serious challenges. And so you know, Xi Jinping, you know, may feel like he's going over the top of the roller coaster at, at this point. He hasn't started descending yet, but you can tell that it may be coming. And, you know, we can talk in a lot of detail about this, but the two basic problems are that China's economic model uh, has run out of juice. And, and so, you know, you're no longer going to be looking at the 12% growth rates that were common in the late 90s and early 2000s. You're not even going to be looking at the seven, eight percent growth rates that the CCP claimed uh, during the decade running up to COVID. And I say claimed because all of these things should be taken with a grain of salt because of a variety of issues, because of bad demographics, because of a faltering commitment to economic reform, because of a political system that has become more neo-totalitarian and thus less hospitable to economic growth because the world is becoming increasingly worried about China and is no longer willing to have, um, you know, China deeply insinuated into its own uh, economy and its own technological ecosystem in the way that might have been true 20 years ago. Um, you know, for other reasons still, uh, China is just going to have a hard time growing at any anything like the rates that the world became accustomed to in the three or four decades after the beginning of the reform and opening period. In 1978. At the same time, China has managed to alienate almost every advanced democracy in the world over the past few years. Uh, it has managed to alienate many of its neighbors, uh, India, for instance, the Philippines, which was ready to fall into China's lap about uh, five or six years ago, South Korea, um, which has become, by you know, opinion polling standards, one of the most anti-China countries in the world. And so everywhere China is trying to expand its influence right now, you have a growing group of countries that either individually or collectively are starting to push back. And you can see this in the way that Japan is doubling defense spending over the next five years. You can see it 
in the way that the Philippines has now invited the United States to have access to uh, a total of nine facilities uh, in that uh, country, uh, some of which are quite relevant in a conflict over Taiwan or the South China Sea. You can see it in institutions like the Quad or AUKUS, which are basically groupings of democracies where what they all have in common is they're really, really worried about China dominating the Western Pacific and, and potentially reaching even beyond that. And so when you put all this together, uh, China's period of most effortless economic growth is over. It, it really is going to have a very, very hard time overtaking the United States as the world's largest economy. And we can kind of set aside the question about whether that actually even means anything in terms of the relative power that China wields vis-a-vis -vis the United States. It's going to have a very, very hard time convincing other countries to sort of get out of its way and just let it have its due in Asia and beyond, because so many countries are afraid of what China is and what it represents. This is the peaking power syndrome, right? But the problem is that China has articulated these huge ambitions and countries don't peak in all dimensions at once, right? And so China may be peaking now strategically and economically. It's not peaking militarily, at least for another few years. And so that's what makes peaking powers of this sort so dangerous. They start to lose confidence that things will be going their way a decade from now but they increasingly have the ability to do something about it now or in a few years. When you look historically, that's the combination that helps to produce uh, German behavior on the eve of World War I, and we all remember how that went. It's the combination that helps produce Japanese behavior in the run-up to World War II over a somewhat longer period. And, and that's really the danger in thinking about an aggressive China today. Like, what about uh, among the headwinds to talk about? Tell us a little bit about the, their demographic problems. Yeah, I think this uh, is is probably the most stark um, one because demographics was explains a quarter or more of China's rapid rise. So basically, you know, the reason one of the main reasons China was able to grow so fast for so long out of uh, over the last thirty years was that it had anywhere between ten to fifteen people of working age for every elderly retiree in its population. That's two to three times the global average. I think it's about five times what the United States currently has in terms of workers to retirees. And so no, no, um, no, I don't think any country in human history has been more primed for productivity than China was over the last 30 years. And it really just has to do with the unrepeatable sort of peculiar population history where, you know, China just had decades uh, in the first half of the, the the 20th century of just getting torn apart because of its civil war and and Japanese brutality and other imperial powers. And so you had this this uh, a, a generation that was sort of wiped out. And so when Mao finally unifies the country, he wants to rapidly repopulate the nation. And so the Chinese government incentivizes Chinese families to have lots of children and they oblige. The population explodes by 80% in 30 years from uh, the 1950s going into the 1980s. You also had an epic increase in life expectancy um, as well during that time. So a huge baby boom generation comes of age in China um, and they all reach you know, their, uh, their uh, uh, prime years of working in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. But the Chinese government, you know, in, in the late 1970s, uh, starts to worry about overcrowding and implements the infamous one child policy. And so for the last 30 years, things have been quite good for China demographically because you had this baby boom generation in the prime of their working lives. They had relatively few elderly parents to care for because so many of them had died in the famines and chaos of, of previous decades. Yeah. And they, they had few children to care for because they weren't allowed to have them, um, but now that situation is gonna completely reverse because that huge baby boom generation is about to retire and fall onto the backs of this tiny one child generation. So that, so that 10 to 15 uh, to one ratio I mentioned earlier of workers to retirees, that's gonna collapse to two workers available to support every retiree by the late 2030s. So this is, a, this is actually a sort of a medium term problem for China. Uh, China is going to lose more than 70 million 
working age adults between now and the uh, mid 2030s and gain 120 million senior citizens. That's like taking an entire France of taxpayers and consumers and workers out of the country and adding an entire Japan of elderly pensioners. And that's in less than, than 15 years. I mean, I've seen recent projections based on the leaks that have been coming out from China's most recent population census that suggest the Chinese population um, is going to be half of what it currently is by the 2070s. Uh, it used to be the by 2100, China's population was going to collapse in half, but now they're bumping that date back up by several decades because it turns out that China has been over-reporting its birth rate substantially over the last uh, decade or so, um, and it's uh, the situation is much worse. So, you know, the, the projections of how this is going to affect China um, obviously are probabilistic, but the ones I've seen suggest that it, just in order to take care of this ballooning elderly population, spending on um, elder care, so social security, medical care, is going to have to triple as a share of China's economy, going from about 10% of GDP today to about 30% of GDP um, by, by 20, 2050. And just to put that into context, all of China's government spending right now is about equivalent to 30% of its GDP. So that, that just really shows you the fiscal burden that is going to come down on China at the same, and somehow they're gonna to have to raise that astronomical amount of revenue from a shrinking, a rapidly shrinking um, tax base, a much less productive workforce, because just if you have an older population, uh, it just puts a, a downward uh, pressure on, on productivity. Um, and, and this doesn't even count the, the potential social dislocations that may come from uh, China's demographics. So one of our colleagues at, at the American Enterprise Institute, Nicholas Eberstadt, has done really amazing research just showing that um, China's aging problem is going to um, eviscerate what has really been the key institution of Chinese society for millennia, namely the family. Uh, you have these big extended families and you know the, the young take care of the elderly parents and they all help raise the children. Now, uh, you know, because you have this one child generation, you know, future generations are gonna have five times fewer cousins than have been prevalent in the past. So that not only means you have fewer relatives to help you take care of grandma when she gets old, but it just also means a, 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 an entire generation of sort of socially isolated individuals. Um, and then you also have the issue of just a, a, an excess of roughly 40 million males over females because um, after the one child policy, a lot of Chinese families would uh, preemptively abort uh, uh, female fetuses because there is a cultural preference for males. And so you're going to have, you know, roughly 40 million bachelors for life with no prospects of of raising their family i mean who who knows what kind of, you know, just just having been a young man myself at one time and and doing all the dumb stuff men can get up to before they're sort of tamed by the responsibilities of having a family and um you know having uh prospects it's just it, it there's been all kinds of interesting sort of hypothetical studies about what this could mean for social stability in china the kind of decision making it might cause the regime to go into if they know they have this excess of males um, around that they need to find something to do with. Um, so it's it's a quite horrifying situation, even above and beyond the sort of fiscal and economic efficiency aspects. So this sort of situation then underscores the urgency uh, for their global ambitions then, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's it, there's copious evidence that China wants to be the preeminent power in Asia and, and ultimately in the world. That's increasingly spelled out explicitly in a lot of Xi Jinping statements and party documents. But it's one of those things where kind of the, the farther you get into this century, the harder and harder it is going to be for China to achieve that because of all the limitations that Mike has talked about and thus the urgency. And this also sounds like a danger to the Communist Party, too. If you can't have a, right, the, the core of their success has been the growing economy. If the economy stops growing, then the party could be in trouble, right? Yeah, and, yeah ab absolutely. I mean, this is a big part of the, the social compact in, in China, which is that, you know, you get zero political rights, but at the very least, um, materially speaking, you will live better than your parents did. You will live, you know, much, much better than your grandparents who may have come of age, you know, sometime between the war with Japan and the Cultural Revolution did. 
And so that creates a certain amount of legitimacy with the population. That That is, I think, out the window for the most part. It's, it's not that China's economy is in free fall. It's just that it's not going to be hitting the growth rates that are necessary to continue raising the standard of living unless you assume kind of mega breakthroughs in uh, new areas of technology. But I think it's not a mystery what the CCP's answer to this will be. In fact, we're already seeing it. And, and so it's kind of a threefold answer. And so one answer is that you double down on repression. And so you build the world's most sophisticated surveillance state, and you use that to ensure through means that are both relatively subtle and then quite heavy handed that no organized political opposition to the party ever emerges, right? That's kind of the prime directive. The second piece is that you double down on ideological mobilization that, that looks, you know, kind of reminiscent of what you might have seen decades ago before Mao Zedong died. And, and so it's everything from, you know, promoting Xi Jinping thought and enshrining it in the constitution and what is kind of a conscious echo of Mao Zedong thought to, you know, really ramping up um, some of the rhetoric around preparation for struggle and, and things that Mike talked about earlier, uh, and generally just kind of trying to revive some of the uh, enthusiasm that uh, attended the party's rise to power in the first place. And then the third thing is that you double down on nationalism. And we've seen this over a long period of time, but, but certainly, you know, the narrative that the CCP tells about its own place in Chinese history has always been wrapped up in this idea of kind of recovering the greatness of the past, getting over, getting beyond the century of humiliation, returning China to its rightful place at the top of the international hierarchy. But that's only become more pronounced as other forms of legitimacy have faded. And so if you look at the incidents of, you know, official anti-Japanese rhetoric or anti-American rhetoric or hostility to the outside world in general that's wrapped up in this pursuit of Chinese greatness, it's become much, much starker under Xi Jinping. And I think it you know, has some fairly troubling implications for what we might expect from Chinese policy in the coming years. And what do you think about how the Chinese view America and the West and, and how does this link to their aggressive policies? Yeah, I think, um, you know, China, basically since Tiananmen has uh, been wary of the United States um, because they they knew that the, the sort of tacit alliance between the United States and China in the latter half of the Cold War was motivated primarily by cold geopolitical logic. And so when you have the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, they, they immediately started worrying that they were going to be next. And when you had the Tiananmen Square massacre, uh, they they worried very much about um, the sort of demonstration effect that the Chinese people were going to start looking to the United States and other democracies and wondering why they don't have those rights and start agitating for them. And so even during the heyday of US-China engagement in the 90s and early 2000s, it's now come out, there's been lots of documents that have come out where you have Chinese leaders saying behind closed doors, um, you know, this this is essentially stealth containment. You know, the Americans say they want to bring us into this liberal order, but they're, they want to do it to basically uh, peacefully evolve us out of existence. They want to erode the Chinese Communist Party's iron grip on power and its political monopoly and use economic liberalization to destabilize the CCP and eventually turn us into some kind of democracy or just see chaos reign supreme in, in China. And so now that the United States is now not no longer engaging China, but in fact is containing China, obviously anti-American sentiment has gone through the roof in part because the CCP is dialing up anti-American um, propaganda, uh, as Hal, Hal mentioned, you know, things like um, Korean War uh, era movies are sort of all the rage now because that obviously is the war where um, in Chinese telling they defeated uh, the Americans uh, with, with the help of uh, uh, North Korea. Um, you see it reflected in more popular uh, uh, movies, you know, the Wolf Warrior franchise and those kind of things where you have, you know, um, some American mercenaries that have to be taught a lesson by 
the Chinese heroes, and you see it just in explicit um, um, propaganda videos of you know uh, of Chinese uh, uh, military forces uh, taking out um, aircraft carriers that look exactly like American aircraft carriers and, and bases that look exactly like American bases. And you have most recently Xi Jinping explicitly calling out the United States for orchestrating this ring of encirclement around China. And frankly, you know, and some, sometimes I think, because a lot of Americans say, well, why, you know, there's no, we're not trying to confront China and we, we should be in, we're talking to the Chinese and trying to integrate them. And sometimes I think the Chinese understand American interests almost better than most Americans do. I mean, American presidents like Bill Clinton were explicitly saying that the Chinese were on the wrong side of history and that the whole point of the engagement policy was to change China, which is an existential threat for the CCP. And today it's just explicit that the United States is trying to uh, contain Chinese military expansion and to slow down its technological progress. So, you know, this kind of gets back to Hal's point earlier that this is not a misunderstanding, that the, the two countries understand each other very well, and it's just a straight up clash of interests. And the CCP as a Leninist regime without the safety valve of elections has a strong incentive to demonize foreign rivals, especially the United States, to say, look, like the world is turning against us. We need to all band together to, to ride out these, these stormy seas ahead. Um, that's that's a tried and true method by dictators throughout history. Do you think they see the West um, as a, um, a civilization in decline versus their ascendancy? I think, it, I think it's complicated. I think that Chinese assessments of the West and of the United States in particular are uh, ambivalent almost to the, the point of schizophrenia. And, and so you can find lots of examples of Xi Jinping saying the East is rising and the West is declining. You know, certainly Chinese propagandists have a field day with everything that seems to show the United States struggling. So January 6th, right? Uh, the COVID experience, um, you know, every time the United States uh, has to resort to a continuing resolution to fund the government, right? You can count on Global Times and uh, People's Daily to weigh in and, and point out that this is evidence of kind of a decadent civilization that is past its prime. But at the same time, you know, the, the Chinese, if you look at, you know, statements from everyone from Xi Jinping to hawkish figures within the PLA, there is a real sense that, you know, countries that have challenged the United States before typically haven't fared that well. That's That's been a really good route to, you know, political and sometimes national destruction for those countries. There is still very much a sense that the West has a powerful ability to try to impede China's progress. And so Xi Jinping gave a speech at the beginning of March where he basically said that United, the United States and its buddies are waging a campaign of suppression and containment against China that was posing, uh, I believe the phrase was, unprecedented difficulties for China's development. Um, you can find examples of uh, individuals within the Chinese academic community, or again, that are close to the PLA, basically saying, uh, be very careful about bringing down the hostility, not just of the United States, but of all of its allies and kind of the, the global West. So including, you know, Japan, South Korea, so on and so forth, Australia, uh, because that is the path to ruin for a country like China. And so the, you know, Chinese assessments of the strategic balance or kind of the net assessment of the international environment I think mirror the dynamic that we're talking about here, which is that you have a country that is very capable and confident on the one hand and deeply concerned, sometimes alarmed, sometimes very pessimistic about what the future holds in terms of its relations with the outside world. Um, I think it's time for our audience to uh, hear some of their questions. Uh, so let's see what we've got here. Uh, Tom Hardy asked, says, uh, the military solution is clear. 
what might be alternative options to avoid this war? For example, could diplomacy by China, the US, Taiwan, as well as others, Europeans, um, uh, change the situation? Um, I, I assume, so I, I assume the question is about the, the Taiwan situation, um, you know, and to me, obviously there's been a, a, a diplomatic settlement that has kept the peace uh, for for several decades, where the United it's this sort of convoluted compromise of the United States, you know, uh, acknowledging the Chinese position that Taiwan is um, part of of China and China um, supposedly abiding by a peaceful what you know, the United States insists has to be a peaceful resolution of the issue. But I just think at this point the issue is becoming very zero sum, and the drive one of the driving forces is what Hal alluded to earlier, which is just simply that the Taiwan is fundamentally changing. The Taiwanese people increasingly see themselves as Taiwanese. Um, and, you know, I just, Beijing is basically running out of peaceful reunification options, and that's why you see it increasingly flexing its military muscles. So to me, I, I, I worry that there really isn't a long-term diplomatic settlement that can make all sides happy and continue to uh, keep the peace. Um, you know, maybe more creative minds can figure out another sort of convoluted exercise, but I just worry at this point, there's not a lot of convincing Xi Jinping that he should lay off Taiwan. Um, and if you read his statements, they just sound very ominous that I actually worry that he is starting to feel like this, this is a key part of his legacy, that he views himself as the one that will create the great unification of the Chinese nation and a great rejuvenation of that nation. Um, and, you know, having witnessed Putin um, in his decision-making process, where apparently he spent the COVID lockdowns next to statues of Catherine the Great and pondering his own place and sort of Russian historical greatness, um, I worry that similar dynamics could take over. And it's just hard to see how you get a, a good diplomatic settlement. Now, you could have, I think there are things the United States can refrain from doing that can maybe uh, buy some time or at least prevent the situation from boiling over. So, that, you know, there's legislation on Capitol Hill making all these sort of cosmetic changes to, you know, what we call, you know, the building where we have our diplomat station or sending over all these congressional delegations. I actually thought the way that the um, visit between Tsai Ing-wen and Kevin McCarthy went down, I mean, that's a good example of trying to figure out kind of workarounds um, so that all sides can save some face just so that you don't instigate a crisis. But in terms of actually leading to a longer term diplomatic settlement. I mean, if you just saw Macron go over and try to <laughs> convince Xi Jinping to do anything that he wasn't going to do already, I mean, to me, that just shows you the futility of the situation. And so unfortunately, uh, the priority now is more on deterrence and damage limitation, because there just aren't easy ways um, to create a, a melding of minds through through diplomacy. It's somewhat of a similar question. If, <clears throat> uh, back to the Tom Friedman piece I mentioned before. Um, Mel Oppenheim uh, says that uh, Friedman uh, has identified the word trust or lack thereof as the reason for breakdown between the US and China. Uh, do you agree with him? And if so, do you see a path forward to rebuilding trust between China and the United States or the West? I, I mean, I'll, I'll say, you know, no, no and no, basically, um, uh, just to be to be blunt about it. I mean, look, so look, I, there there is a problem of lack of trust between the United States and China, but that's a symptom rather than a cause, right? And so I, I don't, uh, I distrust my enemies because they are my enemies. They're not my enemies because I distrust them, right? And and so the basic problem is that the United States and China are pursuing totally different visions of how the world should work, how the world should work everywhere from the Taiwan Strait to international organizations to the global economy. And, and that that is the root of the problem. Now that results in a lack of trust because it means that the two sides, even when they're talking to each other diplomatically, will be trying to strengthen their respective positions so they can ultimately impose their preferences on the other. And I'll give I'll give you an example of this to make it a little bit more concrete. So um, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the meeting between Joe Biden and Xi Jinping in November 2022, where 
on the heels of that, you had a lot of talk, particularly on the American side, that we had established guardrails on the U.S.-China relationship, that, that both countries agreed that it was not in their interest to have another Cold War, let alone to have a hot war, that we were going to reopen all of these di uh, channels of communication and dialogue that had been closed uh, or dormant, uh, many as a result of the 2022 crisis in August over Taiwan. There were going to be a series of sustained interactions at the sub kind of presidential level. So the Secretary of Defense would get on the phone with his counterpart. Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, would get on the phone with his counterpart and so on and so forth. And this was going to get us to a calmer period in U.S.-China relations after all of the turmoil of 2022. Uh, and it did for about two and a half months. And then you had the balloon incident, you had uh, further frictions over Taiwan, and it's just a matter of time until we get the next thing. Because even though, you know, of course, neither side wants to find itself in a new Cold War or a new world war, which would be, you know, far, far worse than that. But neither side has changed its understanding of who the other guy is, right? And neither side has changed their view that if they don't take steps to strengthen their position, they risk being left behind in this competition. And so that what that means is that any seeming equilibrium in the U.S.-China relationship is going to be very unstable because there will be things that happen around Taiwan, around technology, around espionage that threaten to derail it. And so I, I don't say this because I think that, you know, we should never try to talk to the other side. I mean, one of the arguments we make uh, in the book, in fact, is that diplomacy, even with a country that wants something fundamentally different, can be useful. It can be useful in kind of trying to understand what the other side is doing and thinking. It can be useful in reassuring allies and partners and convincing your own people that you're not the ones driving tensions in the relationship. But but we need to be you know extremely sober and frankly skeptical about what this will actually accomplish. And I'll, I'll go you know one step further than that actually and say that. The impression that I have taken away from the past few months is that the Chinese government is just fundamentally uninterested in meaningful diplomacy with the United States. Now, they, they have taken that position because they believe that the United States is fundamentally interested in serious diplomacy with China. But uh, during late 2022, when COVID was ripping through China, the United States government went to the Chinese government and said, what can we do to help and got the Heisman uh, in response. Uh, the Chinese have been in no hurry to reschedule the visit of Tony Blinken to Beijing. Uh, there was just recently an editorial in the Nationalist mouthpiece, the state-run Global Times last uh, Thursday, I think, basically saying we don't talk to unserious people, the unserious people being us uh, in this case. And, you know, you really get the sense that the Chinese government simply believes there's not a whole lot of point to interaction, you know, sustained diplomatic interaction with the United States. That may be a stratagem. It may be a way of trying to get the United States to chase it. Uh, it. It may be something that changes over time. But we're just entering a very fraught phase in this relationship where lack of trust is, is one of the effects of the competition. But I don't, I don't think it's the cause, unfortunately. Um, Howard Miller, sort of continue this line of, of, of thought. Uh, he says, are there areas of common interest and mutual benefit where cooperation is possible? Mike? Uh, so in theory, yes. In practice, um, it seems increasingly not. So I can think of a lot of things that the United States and China clearly have mutual interests. Avoiding war, obviously, is a huge mutual interest. Economic interdependence and trade is another area where presumably they should want to get rich together. Climate change, you know, we're all on the same spaceship, so we got to take care of it. Uh, disease pandemics, but, you know, the just recent events have, have made me incredibly pessimistic because it seems like even these seemingly positive sum win-win type issues have been infused with zero-sum competition. So even something as simple as, uh, you know, where did COVID come from? 
is a, a point of, of uh, sharp contention. You'll get a very different answer if you ask that question in Washington, D.C. versus in um, Beijing, or who bears more responsibility for climate change or should be doing something about it. Again, there just doesn't seem to be a melding of the minds. Maybe, you know, John Kerry's uh, forays can, can change that. Um, you know, I know the hope of the Biden administration was that even as you compete against China on geopolitical and even economic issues that the United States should be, um, you know, negotiating on transnational issues like climate change. But it just seems like the Chinese, um, you know, at, to Hal's point, are just not interested in, in that kind of meaningful dialogue. So, um, you know, this is the, the great frustration is that in theory, you should have this kind of cooperation, you know, even the United States and the Soviets were able to help eradicate smallpox during the, the Cold War. But with the United States and China at this particular moment, it just seems like it's really hard to make any kind of forward progress, because each of these issues gets marshaled into a competitive dynamic. Uh, Michael Shapiro asks, uh, will the Philippines and Australia aid the U.S. in defending Taiwan? And a similar question by Joe Daly. What's the likelihood that Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam would join in a defense of Taiwan? Could the U.S. prevail without them? If not, would the U.S. even try? Hal? So, great question. I, I would say that um, if some combination of those countries, which, which has to start with Japan, joins the United States in the conflict, I think it's very hard to see how China prevails because you're, you're taking on then not simply the global superpower, but also a regional military heavyweight. The United States would have um, basing options uh, beyond what it has had in the past and, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's fundamentally more favorable to the United States the more countries it gets involved, so long as it's the right countries. Now, the question is, would they be involved? The Japanese have said about as explicitly as they're ever going to that they would, in fact, be involved in some way or another in a war over Taiwan, assuming it was started by unprovoked Chinese aggression. Because they they view Taiwan as almost uh, you know a vital interest, almost an existential interest for Japan in the sense that Taiwan is only about a hundred miles from some of the southwesternmost Japanese islands. If China grabs Taiwan, it really can put a stranglehold on some of Japan's uh, sea lanes and and so on and so forth. And just add in the fact that if China wants to win a war over Taiwan. It has to attack the U.S. base at Okinawa, which is part of Japan, and it's hard for me to see how Tokyo manages to stay out of it. I think Australia is mostly in the same boat. The Australians, again, have, have indicated within their own policy of strategic ambiguity that they would find it very hard to just kind of stand by and see China attack Taiwan. It depends a little bit on, on which official and which government uh, you're talking about. But, but in general, I think that's true. The challenge is that Australia just has much less capability to bring to the fight than Japan does, in part because it's a smaller country with a smaller economy, and in part just because of geography. And, and so Australia would be able to contribute something, but it wouldn't be nearly as important as what Japan could contribute. If you'd asked me three years ago, would the Philippines be involved, I would have said almost certainly not. Um, today, I would say, yeah, maybe, right? Because you have uh, a new government since 2022 in the Philippines that has really breathed new life into the U.S.-Philippines alliance. As I mentioned, uh, the Philippines is opening up a number of facilities to the U.S. military, which you know really are only make sense if you're thinking about a Taiwan context. And I think a world in which China has managed to uh, conquer Taiwan, push the United States back, uh, is a pretty ugly world for the Philippines and the South China Sea and, and beyond. I think, again, it's a question of kind of like when and under what circumstances and so on and so forth. But if I had to bet a dollar, I would say that, yes, the United States would get some support from the Philippines in a war. Um, and then, you know, you can go down the list from there. I think South Korea is in a little bit of a different place. Taiwan is never going to be their primary security challenge as long as they have to worry about North Korea, but maybe they would help with respect to logistical support or basing or, or so on and so forth. There has been some talk about 
uh, European powers, so not NATO or the EU as an institution, but but maybe the UK, France, um, you know, maybe the Netherlands or something like that, playing playing some sort of modest role in the conflict. The, 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 the long and short of it, I think, is that the core of any coalition would be what's sometimes referred to as the three plus one, right? So the plus one being Taiwan and the three being the US, Japan, and Australia. And then whatever else you can get beyond that is, is good to, to have. But it is really important because the larger the coalition is, the more military options it will have and the United States will have, but also the higher the strategic price China will have to pay to conquer Taiwan because it'll have to go to war with a whole bunch of countries as opposed to going to war with just the United States and Taiwan, which would be pretty daunting in its own right. Yeah, um, along the same lines, Bob Meyer asks, would North Korea likely enter a war over Taiwan? And how would that influence uh, the likely outcome? I, I don't really know. I, I would worry that North Korea might take advantage of the chaos yeah. in the region uh, to uh, try to advance its own interests. Um, but I, I just think, you know, we're getting so far into hypotheticals. I don't really know what North Korea um, would do. I mean, you see them advancing on their missile and nuclear program as the world is sort of distracted by uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's belligerence in the region. So I think there's all the reason to assume they would eke out any advantage they could uh, amidst the chaos, whether they would be actively attacking American forces alongside their Chinese um, ally. Uh, I, I, I have no idea. I don't know if Hal, do you have do you have a sense of uh, decision making in Pyongyang and a Taiwan contingency? Yeah, I mean, like you know, look, the, the North Koreans aren't going to commit suicide for China, right? And and so it's sometimes the scenario you hear brooded about is that um, you know China will sort of ask or instruct North Korea to attack South Korea to create more problems for the United States. I, I just don't see that happening. The North Koreans don't particularly like the Chinese. The feeling is more than mutual. And you don't you know, maintain the family dynasty over 80 plus years by will it be willing to take existential risks for other people. I think Mike is right that you know, would North Korea maybe engage in some opportunistic coercion vis-a-vis -vis South Korea if it looked like the war was going poorly for the United States, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I think that that's certainly the fear in, in Seoul. I mean, the, the good news is that South Korea has a very capable conventional military. I think most I think most people assume that South Korea, just on convention in a conventional fight, could handle North Korea. The problem, of course, is that South Korea doesn't have nuclear weapons and North Korea does. And so the South Koreans would still be looking to the United States to provide kind of that extended nuclear deterrence, even as it was wrapped up over Taiwan. But I guess the, the fundamental point I would make here is like, it, it's not really a question of like, what other bad thing would happen once the United States and China are fighting each other. It's it's sort of, it's, you know, it's like the Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Like, what? why are you worried that you can't swim when the fall has already killed you, right? Like, this would be a war between the U.S. and China, the, the two largest economies in the world, probably the three largest economies if Japan gets involved. It is going to involve risks of nuclear escalation from moment one. Nobody has a clue how the war would end. It would tear apart uh, trade routes and technological supply chains. I mean, th this would just be so awful that none of us can imagine it. And so um, there are players who could make it worse, but it, it would be such a cataclysm that, that all, all these other things would just kind of add marginally to the damage. A question came in and I, I didn't say by who, um, asking what kind of reaction have you got from, from your book? <laughs> well, we uh no, you can take that one mike <laughs> <laughs> no, have, uh, you know it's funny our um our uh, a couple of our colleagues i think even before the book came out um wrote um uh essentially a rebuttal in foreign affairs arguing that china uh wasn't peaking um uh i i don't you know we, we can we can have it out um but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm going to kick it back to Hal, actually. I, I don't like commenting on uh, the reaction yeah, it, for other it's people. A, it's, a, it's, a little, it's a little bit meta, I suppose. But, um, <laughs> you know, look, I, I'll, I'll say this. I, I think that um, 
there has been a shift in the way that kind of Washington thinks about the China problem over the past two years. And uh, I am certainly not going to claim that our book caused it. I think it's like a lot of intellectual shifts, like a lot of different things happen at once. But I think, you know, in gen like if you would ask two years ago, is a U.S.-China war over Taiwan likely in this decade? Most people would have said, no, like that's a 2030s problem. You get a different answer now, right? If you'd said, you know, China is a peaking power in 2021, most people didn't buy that. I, I don't know if most people buy it now, but more people seem to buy it. Again, there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? Like it's it's not that people are reading our book and coming to some epiphany. It helps that Xi Jinping is, you know, simulating a blockade of Taiwan while the Chinese economy is struggling to come out of zero COVID and, and so on and so forth. But at kind of a broad level, I, I think it probably is fair to say that there is more receptivity to kind of the ideas that the book represents than there might have been a handful of years ago. Yeah, I would I would say some of the lexicon has has changed. I mean, you see uh, the Pentagon, you know, talking about this as the dangerous decade, which is you know a phrase that we use. You have uh, Mike Gallagher and his new committee on on the Capitol talking about how this is we need to look at U.S. China competition as you first have to win a sprint. Uh, as China, you know, sort of peaks and and really tries to max out its power before you can get to the longer term marathon um, against China, that's straight, you know that's out of stuff that we've written. So again, you know, whether they they read our stuff and immediately decided to borrow that, you know, uh, we're we're not going to presume that we're um, that influential. We're just academics at the end of the day. Um, but I think it just it shows you that there is this kind of chorus of voices growing and moving in the same direction and frankly as Hal said largely instigated by China's own actions sometimes I almost worry or fear like it's like they're almost trolling people back in the United States yeah. because they do things that like we would have thought were beyond the pale and that um, people that are advocating a more dovish approach to China say oh China's not going to do this and then they come out and do it basically the next day um, so you know I think a lot of it is just a, 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 a reaction um, among many people to to what they're observing coming out of Beijing. And D by the way, DOD just banned people reportedly from talking about timelines to a Taiwan scenario because it had become so common within the department, including what people said publicly, that they said this is becoming counterproductive. Well, both of you, thank you so much. We, we, this has really been enlightening, uh, raising our, our consciousness about this subject. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, our next Fridays at 1 will take place the next fall. Um, and uh, anyway, Hal, Mike, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ken. And thanks to uh, Joanna and Ruth and everything, everybody else for helping to set this up. It was a great pleasure. Thanks for having us. Okay. Goodbye, everybody.